cancer. I'm Maggie Nicholas Alexander, the Senior Director of Gynecologic Cancer at SHARE. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about our upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during today's presentation. When Dr. Weston finishes presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You are welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. When asking questions, remember that Dr. Weston is unable to give specific medical advice. So please keep your questions general in nature. I also want to mention that closed captioning is available for today's program. You can enable this feature by clicking the transcript button on the bottom of the screen and, select and selecting the subtitle option. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker who we are so excited to have join us today. Dr. Shannon Weston focuses on developmental therapeutics and the use of biomarkers to predict response and recurrence in gynecologic malignancies. She currently serves as the Director of Early Drug Development and Phase One Trials in her department and is a co-director of the Ovarian Cancer Moonshoot. At her institution, she is currently the PI or co-PI for greater than 30 novel treatment trials in gynecologic malignancies. In addition to previously serving on the National Cancer Institute, NCI, Uterine Task Force, and Gynecologic Cancer Steering Committee, GCSC. She currently serves as a co-chair of the GCSC Ovarian Cancer Task Force and the NCI Ovarian Cancer Clinical Trials Planning Meeting. So we're so excited to have you here today, Dr. Weston, and I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. Let me just get my slides pulled up. Um, and yeah, th that was such a nice introduction. It gets a little bit out, but soup at the end. Um, the bottom line is it's my passion to develop clinical trials and new treatments for patients with ovarian cancer. Um, and that's why I was so excited to come talk about what we saw at the SGO because there was a lot of great data presented um, for patients with ovarian cancer. And my goal over these next, you know, 40, 30, 40 minutes is to, to really summarize what we saw. And then I'm really excited to, to get to your questions as well. Um, these are my disclosures. I, as I said, I do drug development, so I work with many a company, um, but they're like my kids. I, I don't have a favorite. Okay, so this is what we're talking about. This was the, uh, the annual meeting on women's cancer. The theme was building bridges and breaking barriers, and it was from um, March 18th to 21st in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and we had a number of different um, things that were covered, and I'm going to kind of try to lump them together to, to really see um, uh, and review the, the data the best way possible. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about updates in chemotherapy, both GOG252 as well as the IPOC trial. Then we're going to talk a little bit about PARP inhibition, um, looking at the PRIME trial, the SOLO3 trial, and um, a study of Leuven's um, HRD test and then get into some novel agents and combinations, uh, specifically looking at the Soraya trial, the UPRI um, drug, and Artistry 1. And you might be saying, Shannon, you're using all these codes. I promise we'll dig in on all those and you'll understand everything that I just said very soon. So first, let's talk about chemo. Um, this was a, a 
presentation by Joan Walker um, from University of Oklahoma. This was a study called GOG 252. Now this had previously been presented and we'll review those data, uh, but this was looking at long-term survival, specifically um, and of, of GOG 252, which was a randomized trial of IV versus IP, intraperitoneal chemotherapy, uh, plus bevacizumab in patients with newly diagnosed um, advanced ovarian cancer. And here's your schema. You can see patients were randomized. There were three arms. Um, there was a the the uh, control arm was weekly paclitaxel plus IV carboplatin and bevacizumab. And there were two different um, interventional arms. One was weekly paclitaxel with IP carboplatin. Um, this was a new way to give IP therapy. It was not um, how it had been given previously. And then the other arm was weekly path or just every three week paclitaxel with IP cisplatin and IV IP paclitaxel. So this was a more traditional, this was the standard way we were giving um, IP chemotherapy. And again, all arms had bevacizumab with chemo as, far, as well as at maintenance. Now, just a reminder, um, I think many of you may have seen me speak before, but I'll just go through survival curves. Survival curves, it's over time. The higher we are, more patients surviving. And in this case, progression-free survival means surviving without their cancer growing. Obviously what we want. We wanna see separation between arms. That tells us that our intervention treat, new treatment or intervention treatment is better than the control arm. Is there separation here? Wah, wah, no. So these were data that were already presented that demonstrated there was really no difference between weekly uh, chemotherapy versus IP chemotherapy. And this was a bit of a shock because previously we'd seen benefit to, um, to these types of regimens. But the difference here was everyone got bevacizumab. And so the thought process was, well, if you give bevacizumab, it's kind of the great equalizer. Potentially, don't, you don't see as much impact from IP versus IV therapy. And they teased it out and looked at a couple of different groups, both advanced as well as patients that were able to get to no gross residual on their surgery and still didn't see any benefit to the IP therapy arms. And these were the updates. So this was the, um, the kind of new thing that we, that we saw at this presentation. This was the overall survival. And again, not, no difference in overall survival between the groups, but look at these groups living over 114 months. So these patients did really well. Um, this was a patient population that was able to get to no gross residual disease and got upfront therapy. So pretty exciting um, that, that we saw that type of benefit across the group. They did tease out some interesting clinical scenarios, and this is just more information to know, but they looked at when the CA125 natured, so went all the way down to the lowest possible. And in fact, when they had a patient population that natured prior to the fourth cycle of treatment, they lived longer. And that just kind of gets at, well, their tumor responded better. It was more sensitive. And so they um, were able to uh, get more benefit. So another study, the IPOC study, looked at um, a different, a similar question, but importantly, they looked at it without bevacizumab. So what we just saw with 252, all the arms had bevacizumab. Now, this trial was IP versus IV carboplatin and paclitaxel, but it did not include um, bevacizumab. So this was the um, IPOC trial. Just as a reminder, these are the overarching benefits that we can see with IP chemo over and over again in early studies without bevacizumab. IP or intraperitoneal chemotherapy seem to improve time without cancer coming back, progression-free survival, as well as overall length of life, overall survival. And patients did very well. But later studies, like the one I just showed you, 252 showed it didn't improve. So it was a lot of confusion. So the IPOC study was meant to address this. They randomized patients with upfront, newly diagnosed, advanced um, ovarian cancer, including patients that had bulky tumors. And they either got weekly paclitaxel carboplatin intravenously or weekly paclitaxel carboplatin intraperitoneally, okay? And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. They did also look at um, overall survival as well. <clears throat> 
Now, this is the demographics of the, the patient population. I will say that, um, that overall, this was a pretty um, reasonable group of patients. It did seem to um, represent um, who we normally see, although one big difference the number of Asian patients. This was a study that was done in Japan. And so high populate, high proportion of patients from a, with an Asian background, okay? Um, but otherwise very consistent. And they did have a high proportion of patients with disease um, remaining after surgery. And what they found was that the population that got intraperitoneal chemotherapy did live longer without their cancer coming back. You can see that difference between the curves there, progression-free survival. They also had um, a, um, when they kind of started to tease out who might, um, who seemed to benefit the most, what they saw was that population that um, had higher numbers of residual disease seemed like they got good benefit from IP. Now this is important because most of the studies that had previously been done in, um, in patients with upfront ovarian cancer like this did not, um, the did not uh, uh, include patients with bulky disease. Now, when they looked at overall survival, there was a trend towards benefit to the patients that got um, the dose dense, uh, I, but it was not statistically significant. So again, kind of throwing your heads, hands up in the air here. So it helps people live longer without their cancer coming back, but didn't necessarily live, lived lead to people living longer overall. Why might that be? Well, subsequent PARP inhibition, subsequent bevacizumab, anti-angiogenics, other therapies are gonna impact that length of life. And so sometimes you don't see that with, um, you know, when you're looking at upfront therapy. And then of course, we always wanna know if we're doing something like intraperitoneal chemotherapy, is there more toxicity? Overall, it was about the same, but there were more porch related issues. So those of you that have had IP chemo or know someone who has, will remember that you put the port into the abdomen and that's where the chemo goes through and you can get side effects from that. So just a little um, uh, comparison between the two trials, you can see that the IPOC included patients with optimal debulking, all their tumor removed and suboptimal debulking. Um, whereas the GOG-252 really focused on patients that had just an optimal debulking. They got that, and, and then the big other thing that I mentioned is they got that bevacizumab with their chemotherapy. In addition, when you look at IPOC, there was a much higher number of patients that had residual disease at the end of therapy. And so that's a kind of a more bad acting group, right? That's a group that's higher risk. So the bottom line, just wanted to kind of review now because it can be overwhelming. You're like, is it good? Is it bad? One trial says yes, one trial says no. The bottom line is progression-free survival is improved with IP chemo in that IPOC trial, but not in the American trial GOG-252. There's a couple of reasons, potentially. The bevacizumab, the great equalizer, if you're going to use bevacizumab, you probably don't need to use IP chemo. Um, IPOC potentially benefit in patients with residual disease. Maybe that was why they had disease left behind. The IP chemo helped it respond better. And then of course, I didn't put this here, but the Asian population, we've seen this before where sometimes it seems that different um, races and different ethnicities can respond differently to chemotherapy or other treatments. And it could be something pharmacokinetic, the way our bodies break up drugs. And so that also could just explain why. It may be that certain patients benefit. Some patients maybe with BRCA mutations or patients without, we don't know that. And so I know they're gonna do additional studies to try to tease that out. So maybe you use IP in a population that can't get bevacizumab or PARP inhibitors. And this was something that the author, Dr. Fujiwara mentioned, you know, that in, a, in, a, um, in developing countries that don't have access to some of these drugs, perhaps IP chemo is a nice way to get that benefit without the cost. Okay, so now let's transition. PARP inhibitors have been hot for a while and this SGO was no different. Um, so we have three really interesting studies that I wanted to summarize. The first was the PRIME study that was um, presented by Dr. Ning Lee. Now, I just, before I get into PRIME, I wanna remind you guys of PRIMA, right? So PRIMA was the study looking at PARP inhibitor maintenance. So after chemotherapy for upfront, um, upfront treatment, randomized to PARP or placebo. And this was in an all comers population. They did not have to have a BRCA mutation, but they did collect those data. But any patient could go on if they had stage four disease 
or residual disease after chemo. So it was a high risk patient population. Their goal was to see a benefit in progression free survival. So time without cancer coming back and they did. So this is our um, survival curve and look, you can definitely get some space in between those two curves. Niraparib did provide a reduction in the risk of progression of about 40%. That was in an all comers population, but it was a high risk all comers population. So prime was meant to kind of be a more open population. So it allowed any patient that had stage three or four disease, you know, high grade tumor and had um, upfront treatment with surgery and chemotherapy in any order. And they had to have a benefit. Okay. And then they were randomized two to one to niraparib versus placebo. And they were continued on their niraparib for three years. Um, and the primary endpoint was looking at progression-free survival. Just a snapshot of the patient population. Um, again, very relevant patient population, overall, mostly stage three, mostly high-grade serous. Um, about half had gotten um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The majority had had a full response or a CR, complete response to therapy. Um, and the majority had had optimal tumor reduction, so removal of most of their disease. So I would argue any ovarian cancer is high risk, but this was a more kind of modified or moderate risk group, not as high risk as the PREMA study. And what they found was there was a benefit in the population, the all comers, which is called ITT, the intention to treat population, there was a reduction in the risk of progression of about 65%. So very consistent with PRIMA, very consistent with the other upfront PARP inhibitor maintenance trials. So this provides that additional data for you as a patient that even if you didn't have stage four disease, even if you didn't have residual disease at the end of your surgery, you still could potentially benefit from PARP inhibitor maintenance. They did tease it out by a biomarker. They were using a, a biomarker to look for something called homologous recombination deficiency, which is in, so usually can um, uh, indicate potential benefit from PARP. What they found actually was a little bit confusing. They found benefit in the population that had homologous recombination deficient disease, but they also found benefit in patients without the biomarker. This really leads to some concern. There's a couple of reasons. It could be the patient population, again, the so predominantly Asian population. So perhaps they're more sensitive to PARP inhibitors or more likely there's something wrong with this test. <laughs> this test is not detecting the patients that are gonna benefit from PARP inhibitors. And so that, that was my take on this part of the study. You know, bottom line is it's niraparib gives us benefit and okay? improves progression-free survival across all comers and all risk levels. In this study, they found benefit regardless of biomarker, but it actually is a little concerning that that wasn't a good test and it wasn't really a good measure of the biomarker. So more details to come on that. So back on biomarkers, uh, let's talk a little bit about this study. This is a really exciting study out of Leuven um, looking at an HRD test. And they compared it to a, um, an FDA approved test, which is the Myriad My Choice Plus. Okay. This is a study. They're looking for something called homologous recombination deficiency. So, just as a kind of refresher or reminder, homologous recombination deficiency, the bottom line is we're looking for benefit from PARP. And the way we're doing that is to determine if there's the presence of this deficiency that potentially sensitizes to PARP, okay? And there's a couple of different ways to test. One of the FDA approved um, ways to check is using something called loss of heterozygosity, so LOH, okay? Another FDA approved regimen looks, or uh, test looks at three different things. It's a composite score. They look at loss of heterozygosity, telomeric allelic imbalance, and large scale state transitions, okay? That's the Myriad test that does all three. They calculated from SNP-derived genome profiling, and it has been used as a potential predictive marker as well as potentially a prognostic markers. And again, it is out and available, and many patients are getting this done early on in their cancer care to help decide if PARP inhibitors might be right for them. The issue is, in a lot of countries, it's not approved. You can't get HRD testing. And so what the Leuven group wanted to do was see if they could develop something academically that they could do in their own institution that would allow patients to have that test, okay? And they tested it using the Paolo 1 study, which if you've heard of this before, forgive me, but it's an upfront study, okay, newly diagnosed ovarian cancer. Patients were treated with chemo and bevacizumab and then randomized to either the addition of a laparib to the bevacizumab or just continuing the bevacizumab. And this was a positive study that showed that the combination was uh, beneficial, especially in patients with 
HRD. So this provided a really good group to test their test, okay? So they um, developed their own HRD test and NGOT and Gineco are two groups um, in, um, in Europe. They wanted to identify a new and reliable and feasible test that they could do in academic centers. So six different academic centers used it and they tested it against that kind of standard of care, Myriad My Choice. They had 468 samples and they did that three um, that three factor uh, testing. So loss of heterozygosity, telomeric allelic imbalance and large scale state transition. And they also looked at gene abnormalities too. Okay. And this, um, this little box here just so shows that the population of patients in the HRD subgroup versus the whole Pavla one subgroup were very consistent. And here's the prevalence. So what you can see is on the left is the Leuven test, the new test. And on the right is the Myriad My Choice, the standard of care test. And what they found was very consistent results across patients having HRD positive and HRD negative disease. And in addition, this the results of the genetic testing, so looking for mutations, also was very, very consistent across those groups. So that's very um, reassuring. And then they also did some agreement rates. So they looked at the positive percent agreement, which means how often would they both say that it's positive or how often did they both say it was negative? Um, and then what the overall scoring was and found very high levels of agreement showing that this academic test seems consistent with the FDA approved test. And then of course they looked at outcomes, like did it predict benefit from treatment? And it did. So what's the bottom line for you guys here? The bottom line is this is showing that academic centers can start to develop these tests. And that's really important, especially in other countries where these tests aren't available. Or if you're getting your testing done in an academic center, you don't have to send out one piece here and one piece over there. You can get kind of it all done in one, one fell swoop. So this is moving forward. It'll be interesting to see as they transition into clinical practice. And then finally um, on the PARP, train, um, we saw some overall survival results from a trial called SOLO3. And these were presented by Dr. Penson and colleagues. And as just a reminder, SOLO3 was a randomized phase three trial. It was meant to confirm the expedited approval of Olaparib in the treatment setting. So back in the day, before we were using things in maintenance, we used these PARP inhibitors as a treatment. So patients had disease, Okay, and there was a line of recurrence, two or more lines of therapy, and they had the presence of a mutation, a germline BRCA mutation. And then they got randomized to either the Olaparib 300 milligrams BID twice a day or to non-platinum based chemotherapy. And the options included pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, paclitaxel, gemcitabine, or topotecan. And they wanted to see benefit based on response as well as progression-free survival and overall survival in others. Now, the initial efficacy endpoints, so the beneficial endpoints for SOLO3 have already been reported um, and, um, and published. So what they found was PARP inhibitors did better than chemo, bottom line. It did better from response rate, so shrinkage of disease, um, and it did better from a progression-free survival, so keeping cancer away. So that has been known. So this um, new update was looking to see if overall survival was better. And not surprisingly, it wasn't. And, and what's the reason for that? It, it's because we know that patients are going to get PARP inhibitors later. So if you were on this trial, and you had a BRCA mutation and you were on the chemotherapy arm and you know maybe you got three or four months of chemotherapy and then it stopped working, your provider is likely gonna give you a PARP inhibitor next as long as you're well enough to get treatment. And so that kind of erases that potential benefit of living longer. Now we are hoping with some of our upfront therapies and our upfront maintenance, we will see improved overall survival because getting it early hopefully helps you get a cure. Um, and that's what we're hoping to see with some of those first line maintenance strategies and to, to be determined hopefully over the next few years, we'll see that. So the bottom line for SOLO3 is, you know, PARP inhibitors improved efficacy response rate, progression-free survival over chemotherapy. There was not um, a difference in overall survival, but there were some reasons for that, including people in the control arm withdrawing and getting their, their PARP inhibitor off protocol, as well as some other things. Um, but importantly, they didn't see any new safety single signals and the Olaparib was well-tolerated. All right, last section, 
kind of most interesting or new section, I think I'd say, although, um, you know, chemo and PARP are certainly interesting. But this is a kind of a cool section because it really starts to get into different levels of precision medicine um, that we really haven't seen to date with ovarian cancer. So the first study is the Serea study. Um, and this is looking at a drug called Mervituximab sorvintanzine. So um, I'm just gonna call it Merv. And this is in patients with platinum resistant ovarian cancer that had high folate receptor alpha expression. So let's dig in a little bit on what this all means because it can seem a little overwhelming, okay? So first thing first, Merv is what a new type of drug, new over the last 10 years, called an antibody drug conjugate. Okay, so what it does is it has an antibody, which is a little binder that attaches to cancer cells, okay? And that can be um, towards anything. And in this particular drug, it's towards something called folate receptor alpha. Now, folate receptor alpha is expressed probably in about 30 to 40% of um, ovarian cancers, okay? So this is a, a drug that will work in a specific group of patients. Does that make sense? So if you do not have folate receptor alpha on your cancer cell, this may not benefit you. Okay, so then it has its little antibody binding that target, and that antibody is linked with a little cleavable linker, which just means it gets sliced open, and it's attached to a very high dose chemotherapy, and it's often used, you often hear people use the word payload, and so you have got your payload. It's a much higher dose of chemotherapy than we could ever give you IV. You would get super sick if we tried to give you this high dose payload, and so what it does is it attaches to the cancer cell it tricks it and the cancer cell says, oh, something for me, brings it inside the cancer cell and then it drops its bomb inside the cancer cell. So really cool mechanism um, of action to kill cancer cells. And what we saw in early studies of MERV, in early phase studies, we had these beautiful waterfall plots. And just as a reminder, waterfalling means cancer shrinking, okay? So we wanna see that lots, almost everybody has some sh shrinkage, which is very exciting, but the highest proportion were in patients that had expression of the target, right? Like that makes sense. They had a high level of folate receptor alpha expression. The drug could find the cancer cells and kill them. Okay. And response rates in that really high expression was close to 44%. So almost half of patients got benefit and it was lasted for a long time. So that led to a study called forward one. Forward one was meant to show that mervituximab was better than chemotherapy. And again, it was paclitaxel, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, or topotecan. Um, unfortunately, they, they used a specific folate receptor alpha test that maybe wasn't the best. You can see here in the whole group, not picking out patients with high expression, there wasn't a benefit to, to MERV. And in the folate receptor alpha high group, there actually wasn't a benefit. So that was really confusing and concerning. So they went back to their tissues and looked and, and did checked folate receptor alpha in a different way. They rescored it with something called PFS2. And when you know it, it got better. It improved. The MERV um, seemed to have better um, activity than chemotherapy. So this went on um, and they decided they wanted to confirm this in two studies. One, the Serea study, which I'm going to show you now, and also another study called Mirasol. So the Serea study was a single arm study. It's just looking at efficacy of MERV in patients with folate receptor um, alpha high ovarian cancer, utilizing that PS2 uh, plus scoring. Um, patients could have had one to three prior regimens, they had high grade serous histology, everybody received the MERV, okay? It's 105 patients and it works, okay? There was a 30%, 32% response rate. So 32% of patients had response. But I wanna call your attention over here to the swimmer plot. Swimmer plot tells us how long did people stay on, times on the bottom. People were staying on this therapy for more than a year, including patients without response. And so we did see patients get benefit of just stabilization of disease as well. So that's really exciting. Now, looking at overall um, response rate, they also teased it out by number of prior lines of therapy, as well as um, uh, if they had had a PARP inhibitor before and saw benefit across all those groups. So that's really exciting that even if you'd already had three lines of therapy, which is a lot of treatment, you still could see that 30% response rate. So that's very exciting. 
And then of course, we always want to know if we've got a new drug, how are this, what's the side effect profile? And overall, there can be adverse events. 86% of patients had some type of adverse event, but the majority of those adverse events were low grade. Low grade means reversible or easily managed with supportive care. Now they do have um, these antibody drug conjugates do have a unique toxicity of ocular or eye toxicity, not blindness, usually just blurred vision or irritation of, of the eye, uh, dry eye, things like that. And then other side effects we could see are nausea, fatigue, more standard chemotherapy uh, side effects. Um, overall though, only 7% of patients discontinued due to adverse events. So that's really great because that means, okay, I had side effects, but I could deal with them and I could stay on this regimen that might help. Okay. So bottom line, MERV, Impressive in activity, very good, regardless of the number of prior therapies, regardless of what they got for prior therapy, appropriate safety and tolerability. And we'll see this confirmed now in that Mirasol trial that I mentioned briefly. That Mirasol trial is just taking Soraya and adding a randomization and comparing it to chemo. Okay, so this drug is now being um, reviewed by the FDA for an FDA approval. So in about six months or so, I don't have any inside knowledge, but in about six months or so, we should be able to prescribe this for you as patients. Um, so this is um, coming soon. Okay, so another really exciting novel drug, this drug is called upifidumab, real sedotin, and I'm going to call it Upri for the rest of the time. That's what the company does too. Um, this is an antibody drug conjugate as well, but it has a different target. The target is called nappy 2 b okay? And Deb Richardson and her colleagues presented this at SGO this year. So again, you've got, you guys will remember our discussion around antibody drug conjugates, okay? We've got our little receptor that's going to attack a target on the cancer cell. It's got its linker, and then it's got its big payload. So big mega chemotherapy that we could never give uh, to you in your IV. And so this um, nappy 2 b this is a sodium dependent phosphate transporter, something that brings things into cells, okay? It's expressed on almost two thirds of ovarian cancer cells. So this is exciting. You remember when we talked about folate receptor alpha, that's a select group. This is a different group. We don't know how much those overlap, but this is a potential drug that could work in a patient population that has that test. And you can see that they're developing an assay to check for it. So as they develop this drug, they're hoping to find a test that will help identify who benefits. So this was a presentation of their phase one. So they have an early phase study, but they had already determined what dose to use. And they were looking at it just in patients with ovarian cancer. So they allowed patients with one to three prior lines of therapy high-grade serous histology. Um, they had to have a tumor biopsy or uh, tissue available to do testing for the nappy 2 b um, They continued on the UPRI for um, as long as it worked, so until progression or until there was too much toxicity. Now, they did look, they had, they had isolated two different, common, uh, two different doses, 36 milligrams per meter squared and 43 milligrams per meter squared, and they were exploring both of those dose levels to determine really safety and tolerability and then efficacy. Um, here's the discussion of adverse events. You can see um, this is a little tornado plot or cyclone plot. Um, on the left has the different side effects. So fatigue, nausea, changes in counts, vomiting, diarrhea. It did seem that the 36 milligram per meter square dose did have a little bit less of um, side effects and especially of grade three or four kind of significant side effects as compared to dose group 43, okay? They did not see severe ocular toxicity. Remember, we talked about eye toxicities for these ABCs. Um, they didn't see much neuropathy. Um, and overall, patients did very well. But did it work? The answer is yes. So waterfall plot, you guys in that, I know you're on the audience going, oh, they're falling, that's good. Yes, shrinkage of disease. You can see that the majority of patients had some benefit. 67% had a reduction in their lesion from baseline. Pretty awesome. The orange here is the 36 milligram group and the purple is the 43. So you can see that benefit was across both of those dose levels. So this helps us confirm that that, third, that lower dose level is efficacious and better tolerated. So that is the dose level that they'll move forward. They also teased out the response rate in patients that had um, the high expression of their target, the NAPI-2B, 44% 
reduction in that um, in that group that had NAPI 2D high as opposed to 23% in the all comers. And so this um, this test does seem to help select who will benefit the most. And this is being confirmed in a registration trial called Uplift or GOG3046, where they're giving NAPI or the um, UPRI at 36 milligrams per meter squared um, every four weeks until um, no further benefit. And this will um, hopefully lead to an FDA approval in, uh, for this drug. So bottom line, this is an ADC, uh, antibody drug target, uh, drug conjugate targeting NAPI2B with really great activity, especially in the patients that had expression of the target in their tumor. They're using the lower dose because it's more tolerable and just as efficacious. And hopefully this will be a drug that's available to you all as patients over the next year. All right, getting to my final presentation. Um, this was Artistry One, which is looking at a drug called Nembalucan Alpha, uh, which is a novel engineered cytokine um, in combination with a, a, a checkpoint inhibitor called pembrolizumab, which many of you may have heard of or received. Um, and Ira Weiner and his colleagues presented this. So first let's talk a little bit about Nembalucan Alpha. Um, basically, uh, this is something that was designed to harness the IL-2 pathway, to stimulate the IL-2 pathway. So as it goes, goes into the body as it's given IV, it immediately acts on, um, uh, on the immune cells specifically to activate memory CD8 T cells and NK cells, which are the ones that help us fight cancer. And it doesn't um, impact the CD4 T regulatory cells. And that's important because those guys shut down our immune system and don't allow it to fight cancer. Um, and it um, increases both peripheral and intratumoral effector cells. So it's a stimulant for our immune system. So you could give it by itself, but it's much better to give it with something that's also stimulating the immune system. And so that's why this study looked at that nembalucan in addition to pembrolizumab, which is a, um, a PD-1 inhibitor or a way to stimulate our immune system, okay? They wanted to see the safety profile as well as anti-tumor activity. Um, they looked at a number of different cancer types, but specifically had a plan to look at ovarian cancer. Um, and in that population, it was a small group, um, but they were looking at people that had um, uh, prior regimen with platinum-based regimens and had refractory disease. Okay, so looking at that population, overall, the, the majority of patients had a high-grade serous ovarian cancer, um, and a very small amount were BRCA mutated, and there was a number of prior lines of therapy. 53% had more than five prior lines of therapy. It was a heavily pretreated group of patients, and the majority had had bevacizumab before and PARP before. Um, so first, let's look at safety. 96% um, had some kind of side effect, but serious side effects were in only about 40% of patients, um, and only 10% of patients discontinued because of those side effects. Um, in the combination group, um, the most common um, uh, kind of high grade adverse events were anemia, neutropenia, and blood count so issues. So um, neutrophil count. So that kind of makes sense um, with, with the type of um, action that this drug has. Um, and again, small numbers, but this waterfall plot, pretty nice. And importantly, patients with reduction, many of them remain on therapy for lo a long period of time, including upwards of 150 weeks. So this was really exciting. Um, it's a 30% response rate. So very similar to what we just showed with, um, with some of the other drugs, but you know, immune therapy hasn't really shown that kind of benefit for our patients um, with ovarian cancer. And so this potentially is a way to sensitize ovarian cancer cells to immunotherapy. So Nembalucan, novel engineered cytokine, attempting to stimulate the immune system and seem to have nice tumor response in combination with Pembro and was overall well tolerated. So there's a phase three study called Artistry 7 um, that is ongoing in platinum resistant ovarian cancer. And again, with the hopes that it will be successful and yield another option for you all as patients. So with that, I'll thank you so much for your attention. Um, it's been my great pleasure to be here and I'm gonna end my show so I can see all of y'all. Let's see. Can't find my little. There we go. Thank Hello. you, Dr. Weston. <laughs> that was great. You certainly covered a lot of ground with that. So thank you. But we have a lot of time for QA. So that's great. We'll get the QA started now. You can still submit questions in the QA section at the bottom of your screen.
We will try to get through all of the submitted questions, but we may not be able to do to time constraints. So this first question was in reference to the chemo trials, and this person was asking, why not always add bevacizumab? Yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a great question, and I think that the studies that have been done looking at bevacizumab do show across all comers that it does improve progression-free survival, so time without cancer coming back. However, it did not show overall survival. And so it becomes kind of a balance. And especially when the bevacizumab adds additional cost and time, right? People keep getting that for another 15 cycles. That's kind of why people weigh it. There are definitely patients and providers that choose to do it for every patient. There are others that um, select out patients that seem to benefit the most, which are patients with stage four disease or bulky disease or lots of fluid like ascites and plural effusions, um, and they're more selective there. And I think it really, it goes down to, you know, increased adverse events and potentially cost is the reason why people generally don't use it for everyone. But I think the, that the person brings up a great point. And um, as we see over and over again, that IP doesn't benefit if you use BEV and dose dense doesn't benefit if you use BEV and certain, certain types of surgery don't benefit if you use BEV. So it does indicate that perhaps that drug should be more widely used. Great, thank you. And we got a couple of questions around clear cell ovarian cancer, and if you could speak about any particular updates regarding the treatment of that. Yeah, you know, clear cell is an area, of, a great area of uh, research interest for me. Um, and generally, it's a rare tumor um, that can be seen to be more resistant to kind of standard chemotherapy. Um, it's always been lumped in. You know, it's been lumped in with all ovarian cancer in a number of trials. And what we've found is it shouldn't, <laughs> that it's its own entity. Um, and so, you know, the, as far as some of the, the antibody drug conjugate studies we talked about, you know, that could definitely potentially benefit patients with clear cell if they have those targets. That's one of the nice things about these targeted therapies that it doesn't matter your histology. If you've got the target, a lot of times you'll, you'll still get the benefit. So I think that'll be interesting to see. The other area that we're really interested in with, with clear cell is um, immunotherapy. So in a lot of the early studies of immunotherapy in ovarian cancer, response rates were just about five or 10%, meaning, you know, five to 10 women out of a hundred got some benefit. But when we teased out histology, there were a higher proportion of patients with clear cell getting benefit, indicating that maybe clear cells more sensitive to these immunotherapy or to our immune system finding it. And so we're now exploring a number of trials looking at um, immunotherapy alone and in combination, specifically in patients with clear cell. And we think that's going to have a lot better response to therapy than just, you know, putting somebody on a standard chemotherapy. That's great. Thank you. And sort of continuing on with another rare tumor type, we're also getting several questions about low grade serous and, you know, whether there are updates on treatment regarding that. Yeah, and wow, it's like all my people are on. Um, uh, we so low grade is, is similar to clear cell in that it's a rare tumor type. It's a little different. It tends to be a more indolent, slow growing, but also doesn't respond as well to chemo. Um, and so what we found is that utilizing targeted therapies like anti-hormone therapies or um, therapies that target survival pathways that are activated in um, low grade, like RAS, RAS, um, seem to have more benefit than just doing traditional chemo. So there's a number of studies that are kind of looking at that. One um, is GOG019, which is a study looking at upfront uh, patients that had just been diagnosed with low grade. So instead of, you know, we treat them with surgery, but instead of just giving them chemo, we actually randomize them. A group will get chemo followed by an anti-hormone uh, maintenance, letrozole, but others will just get the letrozole. Cause the question is in a patient where you've removed all of their low grade tumor, do they even need chemotherapy? It doesn't respond very well to chemo. Can you just transition them right to hormones? And then kind of in later lines of therapy, we're really trying to explore maximizing benefit either from multi, um, adding different drugs to anti-hormones that we know work or 
adding different drugs to anti, what are called MEK inhibitors, which again, ta target that RAS-RAF pathway that's active and low grade. So we've got some benefit with single agents. Can we maximize that by adding different agents that make sense? And so that's really what is going on in low grade right now. And there's a lot of really exciting clinical trials that I hope will become available to patients as they're um, deemed to be active. Great, thank you. And then we're also getting a couple of questions about if some of these newer drugs are approved, how do um, how are patients going to be able to access the necessary testing? That's a great question. So yeah, and this is something we're already kind of discussing amongst our pathologists and things. You know, you'll you'll remember I mentioned that the the nice thing about these trials is they're also developing an assay as they're as they're developing the trial. And so the thought process is that as that drug gets approved, the assay will also get approved. It's called a companion diagnostic. And so then your doctor will be able to send that, you know, a piece of your tumor in to get that testing and find out if you qualify. In addition, similar to what we presented with the Leuven HRD test, many academic centers will then work to be able to do their own test and will get that approved. And so you, you and, and not even just academic centers, but also community pathology centers. And so depending on the utilization of the drug and how common it is and everything, it'll get pushed more out into the community. But the goal will be for every patient um, and provider to be able to get that test done so that, um, that we know if it works for you okay, or potentially great. could work for you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And then we got a question from someone who is wondering um, if there's a sort of a benefit to getting these, these tests at the academic center versus not. I think the bottom line is just making sure you're getting the test. And the good news is, is that these tests have to be approved by a, a it, there's something called CLIA, which is basically a, a guideline that, you know, the test has to perform up to a certain level and that you can trust it. And then it's repeated, you know, it's generalizable and, and reproducible and all of those things. So if this is a CLIA approved test, it doesn't matter where you get it. That test will be something you can potentially utilize to, to help guide your, your treatment. Okay, great. And then we're getting some questions about um, NAPI2B um, and expression. And the first question is whether it can be detected or not reliably. And then there's also a question about how do women know if they have this target or not? Yeah. So, you know, that's part of the development of the drug. It's too, it's a little bit too soon, not quite ready for prime time, right? It's still being assessed to see if it's um, a drug that will be FDA approved. And with that will come the test, right? So um, what they're doing is they're, as they're doing these trials, they're checking the way that they, um, that they determine the positivity and they're validating that test, right? So if they see patients that are getting benefit that don't have the target, they're going to go back and say, well, why is that? Are we missing the target? Are we, are we detecting the target? And so that kind of um, assay development is going on as the clinical development is going on of the drug, which is really cool. Um, you know, and then as far as you, how do you know? Well, you know, you could participate in one of the trials that's ongoing. And so finding out where those trials are and getting your tumor tested, it's um, what's nice about a lot of those kind of trials, and this isn't just for up three, but um, many of these other targeted therapy trials, they will, you know, test your tumor for free or for, you know, all, you, you know, you just have to agree to it. And then um, you can, you know, you'll know if you have the target. And then if you don't have the target, you can decide, you know, and, and according whatever the rules of the trial are, you, you may not go on that drug, but at least you have that information. And that goes for the folate receptor alpha, that goes for the nappy 2 b And there are a number of other um, uh, antibody drug conjugates and those types of targeted therapies that are in development that, you know, that this would also, um, uh, relate to. So it's a, it's a neat process. And the goal is to try to make sure we maximize the number of patients we know need this. Um, we, we want patients to get access to drugs that might help them. Okay, great. Thank you. And so this question is going back to solo three, and it's asking whether it was just for BRCA positive patients 
And what is the PARP inhibitor efficacy in non-BRCA disease? Yeah. So yes, Solo3 was only for patients with BRCA mutations, although it did include patients with BRCA mutations in germline, which means hereditary in your, in your blood, or in um, your tumor, somatic, okay? Um, and so, because that seems to act the same. But as far as PARP inhibitor activity, kind of in all comers, it's much lower, right? So what we see is it's got its best activity in patients with BRCA. It's got next best for those patients that test positive for homologous recombination deficiency, HRD, okay? And then there's minimal activity, although some in patients with homologous recombination proficient disease or HRD negative is a way to kind of think of it. Um, and you know the, the reason for it having activity in those patients without a biomarker is probably a couple different. One is our biomarkers aren't perfect. So we may be missing patients that might benefit. Um, the other is there are other things that PARP does. And so for a select group of patients or tumors, it may have activity even though that biomarker is not there. But in general, the most activity is for patients that have the target. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're getting also some questions about the ADCs. So this person is asking um, whether you see it being available to women with autoimmune disorder, autoimmune disorders. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm unaware of any contraindication for women with autoimmune. And I think this, I don't want to play guess what I'm thinking, but I think what this um, person was asking about is, you know, with immunotherapy, um, it's been a little difficult to give in some patients with significant autoimmune disease because you're literally stimulating the immune system. Mm -hmm. And if somebody has an autoimmune disease, that immune system is going to, it's already knowing to, it already attacks things it's not supposed to be attacking. So you don't necessarily want to do that. For ADCs, they don't work that way. And they really are focused on a target that's present in the cancer cell. And so it should be safe in, in patients with controlled autoimmune disease. Um, I would need to go back and look at the trials to see if they excluded anybody like that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I don't think they did offhand. So potentially this is an option for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then um, we're getting a question about whether any of the study drugs that you mentioned, um, whether they're av available outside of the study, so for compassionate use or expanded access. It's a great question. I, I Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Um, each company has their own policy um, for compassionate mm -hmm. use. Some, you know, sometimes they don't, um, they wait until they have an FDA approval somewhere. Um, sometimes they allow it. So that's a that's a very specific um, kind of industry company related uh, question. So I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, and so, okay, this person is asking whether there are any new updates for how long one should stay on a PARP inhibitor past the trial's recommended two-year mark. Sure. So, um, so what this, uh, this person's getting at is, you know, for upfront PARP inhibitor maintenance, the solo one trial, which looked at, um, Olaparib, as well as the Paola one trial that looked at Olaparib, did two years of PARP inhibitor maintenance and the Prima and Prime studies that looked at Neraparib did three years. Okay. The, the study that we have the longest data kind of to date is the solo one study. And what I mean by longest date, it means we have the most time since the completion of the study to kind of see um, how long the benefit is. What we see though is out past five years, even in, into to six and seven years, that patients that stopped at two years still continue to get benefit. There's a slow kind of fall off. There are patients that recur out past, you know, three, four or five years, but for the most part, a high proportion of patients continue to get benefit from the PARP inhibitor beyond when they stop, mm -hmm. right? And this is important because, you know, the PARP inhibitors are tolerated and they're tolerable, but they do have adverse events and rarely they can have tragic adverse events like the development of a leukemia or something called myelodysplastic disorder. It doesn't happen very frequency, frequent. It happens less than 1% of patients, but obviously if you're that patient, mm -hmm. it's devastating. And what we don't know, but what we suspect is potentially the length of time you're on treatment 
may put you at an increased risk. And so being able to confidently say, I can stop this at two years, still get my clinical benefit, and reduce risk of other issues is really critical. So I think many of us feel very confident stopping at those two and three year marks. With that being said, it's always gonna be a discussion with your doctor. Um, you know, I have patients that we got to the two year mark and he said, I'm just not comfortable stopping. I feel worried about that. And we went through the data, we kind of reviewed it, still didn't wanna stop. And as long as she understands, you know, the potential other risks as opposed to the benefit, it's your decision to make um, as long, and obviously make, we have to make sure that your body's still tolerating it and your counts are okay and things like that. But, you know, I think the majority of my patients feel really confident in stopping, but I have had some patients say, you know what, I just rather would stay on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And so back to some of the rarer tumor types, but we got a question about whether there's any news relevant to carcinosarcoma. Carcinosarcoma, definitely a tough one. You know, one of the things that we can see is when that tumor comes back, when it recurs, it recurs as a serous type. So many, like a high grade serous. So many of these drugs could potentially uh, be utilized. I don't know that anyone's really started looking yet to see if, you know, folate receptor alpha or um, nappy 2 b like what's the expression pattern in patients with carcinosarcoma. So that will, I think, be really important to do to determine if, um, if this is a drug that could potentially work for, or if these are drugs that could potentially work for a patient with that. These guys are often excluded from a lot of the upfront studies and it's super frustrating. Um, so I know what we'll do is, you know, we extrapolate and treat them, you know, with these regimens that are developed and, you know, try to see if it works for our patient in front of us. But it's, it's a very, I, I would say it's a, definitely an unmet need. Um, and there's some really great researchers that are looking specifically at that tumor type, both for ovary, as well as patients with uterine cancer that mm -hmm. have that tumor type. Okay, thank you. And then um, with another question about um, the ADCs, but this is around whether they're being tested in just platinum resistant patients or other patients as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think this person's getting at, this is drug development, right? A lot of times what we'll see is that we kind of start in the population that has the highest unmet need. So patients with platinum resistant disease have the kind of the most urgent need, right? They have the shortest potential time period um, to get benefit from something. Um, and so if you see a benefit, it's a, almost like a low hanging fruit. Like you can get a, a registration, which means getting drugs to patients quicker. But if these look good, they're going to move earlier. Okay. So I know for, you know, there's definitely been um, the studies exploring combining mervituximab with carboplatin and upri with carboplatin and looking to see if it's tolerable, is it safe, is it effective? And then if that's possible, then you would imagine that if they see good results, it's going to move forward. I have, again, I have no inside knowledge, um, but that's, that's where you're going to get the drug to more patients and potentially make a bigger benefit. It's just harder to do, right? You have to beat paclitaxel carboplatin, which we saw in those chemo, in those early chemo studies can be hard to do, you know? So it's, it's, it's easier and more kind of straightforward to do it in a population in platinum resistant. And then the ultimate goal will be to move it earlier in platinum sensitive or even up front. It's just a bigger study and harder to do. So I anticipate though, that if the early studies are positive, um, then, then they'll do that. Great. Thank you. And it looks like we're getting close on time. So I think we only have enough time for probably one more question. Oh, so and can I some... mention my little thing really oh, quick, Maggie? Yeah, you mention that I don't... Okay. So you guys see my background, Sprint for Life. This is our 25th annual. It's a 5k run or walk. We usually do it in person, but being extra careful, we're doing it virtually. So you can sign up right here sprintforlife.com. <laughs> um, and you can donate or, you know, buy a t-shirt and, and do your 5k where, wherever you are. Um, we really would love to see your participation. And then next year, come visit us in Houston. It's a really fun event. Great. And so just sort of to close, um, 
I was wanted to ask, you know, what do you really want patients, you know, listening to this webinar today to sort of take away from all of this? Yeah, I think the bottom line is we're doing better from a precision medicine standpoint. So what does that mean? Selecting a treatment for you based on your tumor, based on your characteristics. We're moving away from that kind of one side spits all medicine. And it's a really exciting time because if we can select the right treatment for you, you're going to have a better outcome. So I think that's what I would walk away here from this hearing is we're moving more towards that precision medicine care. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Weston, for this incredibly informative update on what came out of SGO. Um, I certainly learned a lot and hope everyone else did as well. And thank you to all of you who participated in today's webinar and submitted all of these great questions. Yeah. Please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. We use those results to help improve our program. So we really appreciate if you take a minute or two to fill that out. The survey will show up in the browser when the webinar ends and the link will also be sent in a follow-up email. All of the surveys are anonymous. Uh, please check out SHARE's other educational programs and support groups on our website, as well as opportunities, volunteer opportunities at sharecancersupport.org. Um, and yes, thank you again to everyone. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you.